Hey guys, how's it going? So I must confess that this is my first video using iMovie um, and I'm attempting to do a voiceover so hopefully it works and hopefully you can hear me. Um, so yeah, so in today's video, or I guess audio, <laughs> um, I'm just going to be analysing the poem Solitude. So let's get right into it. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Interestingly, the earth is described as sad and old. Borrow its mirth. What is mirth? Mirth means laughter, humour or happiness. So the earth can't produce its own happiness. It must borrow it. I wonder if she is making a comparison also to people too. Can we not produce our own mirth? Do we need to borrow it from someone, something else? Sing and the hills will answer. Sigh, it is lost on the air. So, singing, if in tune, <laughs> is a positive, happy, joyful thing that others can enjoy and react to. Sighing could be seen as a negative action. It does not get a response or answer like singing does. The echoes bound to a joyful sound but shrink from voicing care. To understand the lines better, I rewrote them using synonyms. So, the echoes jumped to a joyful sound, but disappeared when discussing sorrow, anxiety, or grief. Now, that is the version that assumes bound is being used as movement, e.g. she bound down the stairs. Of course, it could have been intended to be used as in bound to happen, which would make it, the echoes are extremely likely to happen to a joyful sound. Now, you might be wondering how voicing care, <laughs> voicing care turned into discussing sorrow, anxiety or grief. Well, in Old English, that's what care meant, which seems to fit in well with the overall theme of the poem. But of course, I am just assuming I could be wrong. Rejoice and men will seek you. Grieve and they turn and go. They want full measure of all your pleasure but they do not need your woe. So yeah, this is pretty much the 1800s way of saying when you're acting all cute and happy, guys want to chill with you. But when you get all sad and actually show emotions, they peace out. They want your pleasure, wink, wink, but they don't want your woe, sad face. Be glad and your friends are many. Be sad and you lose them all, if that ain't the truth. So yeah, when you're happy, people want to be around you. But when you're sad, not so much. There are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. So I get the gist, but what does that mean? Time for another rewrite using synonyms. There is no one who would reject your sweetly filled wine, but alone you must consume life's cruel bile. Why? Because life's gall. Gall is either a reference to gallbladder, aka bile, ew, <laughs> or just simply it's referring to something bitter or cruel. Feast and your halls are crowded, fast and the world goes by. So in the poet's time, in her time, being able to feast probably meant you were comfortable, if not well off, aka wealthy. When you have money, people want to be around that you have, therefore you have a crowd. Fast. Reference to poverty. The world goes by. Nobody cares. You have nothing to offer others in terms of money, food, so there is no crowd surrounding you. Sorry, just had a drink. <laughs> Succeed and give and it helps you live, but no man can help you die. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, no one can help you die. We all die alone. Thanks. 
most part. For there is room in the halls of pleasure for a long and lordly train, but one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. Ah, sorry, I keep drinking. So rewriting the first two lines, we end up with, there is room in the halls of joy for a long and magnificent journey. Focusing on the contrast of the two lines, there is room in the halls of pleasure. This indicates space compared to narrow aisles of pain, which feels claustrophobic. Sorry, I was trying to think of the world. Claustrophobic, narrow, it feels claustrophobic. So therefore, pleasure is luxurious, spacious. Pain, however, surrounds you, traps you. One by one, we must all file on. Due to the previous mentions of death and of a train, this feels like she's describing the inevitable. It's interesting to me how the very first word of the poem is laugh, while the final word of the poem is pain, much like how life is a bit of a laugh, just as it is a pain. Anyway, in conclusion, I think the poem is incredibly well balanced, both in terms of rhyme and its gradual acceptance of the nature of human existence. In many ways, this poem is surprisingly modern, universal, and just bloody fabulous. Um, so yeah, guys, that's about it. Um, and thank you so much for, I was about to say so much for watching. Thank you for listening. And I don't know how to end this. Do I press this?